Friday right here in the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. The Steelers are about to play the Seahawks, and it looks like Mason Ruff's getting the full go. So what does that mean for what he has to do to repeat the kind of success the Steelers had against the Bengals in what is a very much a must-win game for the Pittsburgh Steelers? We'll discuss that, some Mason Rudolph shade throw at Ben Roethlisberger, and all the previews that you need for this weekend, not just for the Steelers game, but the other games that they need to hope to go their way if they have any hope of making the playoffs. It's time to talk about that on the North Shore Drive podcast. I'm Chris Carter with Brian Batko. Let's get into it. You are now listening to the North Shore Drive podcast, a show on all things Pittsburgh sports from the writers of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, hosted by Christopher Carter. Hello, welcome to the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter, here with Brian Batko. It's the Friday edition. We're not at Mike's this week. We had a few things we had, we had to kind of handle on our post personal end. Uh, but with the holidays, I hope you all understand everything that's going on. As always, we're brought to you by Mike's Beer Bar, the best bar in all of Pittsburgh. We're sad we couldn't be there, though no one Hiles, no Hiles and I were there for the pit, uh, pit meet and greet that we did uh, Thursday evening, which was a pleasant experience thanks to those who attended. Um, as always, you can join us here on the North Shore Drive podcast, on your favorite podcasting apps, and on YouTube. We're sponsored by Mike's Beer Bar. And when you go to Mike's Beer Bar, they have over 500 different available beers. 300 of those beers are local. 80 of those local beers available on tap. They have amazing food options, over 20 televisions to catch whatever sporting event that you want to watch. It's an amazing experience to get to Mike's Beer Bar today. So, as I said before, we're joined by Brian Batko. And Brian, it was a question at the start of the week if Mason Rudolph would get the start again. It does not seem like a, a, a question now. As the Steelers have kind of worked with him at the, at the um, at the helm throughout the week, we have not heard a change yet. I think it would be a very big surprise to hear a change at the last minute uh, to Kenny Pickett here. So we're operating under the sense that Mason Rudolph is starting again. Do you see the stuff that Mason Rudolph did last week as something that can be replicated for this by, by the Steelers in this offense, or was that just kind of a a one hit wonder for this offense that we're probably not going to see again for some time? No, I mean, um, talking to quarterbacks coach and interim play caller Mike Sullivan uh, yesterday, he he sort of framed it as we're we're very encouraged, not just because Mason played so well, but now we've put some things on tape that the Seahawks have to account for in this game because they're truly, you know, they've got to take it one week at a time. They, their playoff lives can't be, you know, they they can't play the long game anymore. They've got to win out, and even then hope for some help, which we'll talk about later. But for a team that is, you know, just trying to eke out a win however they possibly can, Saturday to Sunday to then another Saturday or Sunday in Baltimore, we'll see. Uh, they they feel like the, the fact that Mason Rudolph showed some things that opposing defenses have to account for will only help going forward. And will, will Mason turn back into a pumpkin Sunday in, in Seattle? I don't know. We kind of saw that with the Bengals quarterback and Jake Browning. Uh, before our very eyes at Acrisure Stadium last weekend. He was somebody who was riding high, feeling good, uh, you know, re- redeemed himself uh, against the Vikings. And there was the clip of him saying, shouldn't have effing cut me. And eh, everybody thought he was coming in here with a full <laughs> head of steam. And then the Steelers just, uh, you know, they they sent him out on a rail other than the long touchdown pass to T. Higgins. So uh, that's just the the nature of the beast right now in the NFL with all these backup quarterbacks playing and, playing uh you know significant roles for their teams i don't know chris you've probably seen that chart of like the nfl standings and it's like six of the top seven have their quarter their starting original starting quarterback healthy and the rest are just you know in one big uh you know mud pit essentially with backups so it's the ultimate reality show though right now i mean mason (laughs) rudolph everything he does and says and everything kenny pickett does and says it's under the microscope throughout the week, but all that really matters is how they perform when they're out there for 60 minutes, uh, you know, 425 PM our time Sunday when they kick it off. Uh, that's all that's really going to matter is, is, is where, is where, what they do and where they are. But I, I feel you on that. I think that the thing is, is that with Mason Rudolph and with, with all that, the reason that most guys are backups is because when you, when teams get a fix on, on you as a quarterback, 
the truly special ones, the guys that can beat that fix. They can they can find ways to adjust to your adjustments. They can if you try to take things away that they, they that if teams try to take things away that you like to do, you're a quarterback who can adjust, find other ways, or be so good that it didn't matter that they adjusted to that and they and you still work past it and beat it in different ways. And that's where you can see guys like Jake Browning have have a really good run on occasion. Is that teams don't know or, or, or are still adjusting or your coaches can give you a game plan that makes it less predictable as far as where you're going because they can say hey okay we did this last week let's do this this week like last week and you, you brought you brought this up um you know we were talking this before but uh you know the Steelers used Pat Frymouth as a decoy you know because the last time they played the 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 Bengals though it was with Kenny Pickett Pat Frymouth ate them alive and so they said okay we are we are going to devise a plan that if they focus on him, it's going to let other playmakers eat because they're going to get single coverage. That worked last time. Now, what do they do this time? I we we we'll wait and see. But eventually, you know, you, you, it's a game that I that very few teams win um, because unless your guy just gets red hot or you just keep coming up with the right plans in, in the right time, eventually defenses do figure out either the backup quarterback. You know, there's the there's the rare story like Nick Foles where they're able to ride that to a championship, um, but. You know, I, I think it's the question: When does when does Mason Rudolph turn into a pumpkin? I think that that's that's the question everyone's asking about Joe Flacco, who looks fantastic right now. Uh, granted, you know he's a you know a, f- a former franchise quarterback himself, and he's just he's been playing amazing. But I think everyone's wondering: Will he you know turn back into the pumpkin? Whereas the Steelers right now, I think that there are some who delude themselves in thinking that Mason Rudolph can turn into the superstar quarterback of the franchise. And that's not to make fun of him. That's just I think that it's just a reality that like we've seen him play well and then kind of fall off from playing well before we've seen the kind of track record that record that's led to this i think that mason Ruff can have a very good game in, in this one but it takes him doing what he did last time seeing the field making the smart decisions making good decisions and not being you know hastened in the pocket if he does those things i think that he puts himself in a good position to repeat the kind of or give the steelers a chance to repeat the kind of success they had last week i think the natural ebb and flow of game plans and punches and counter punches. I don't think the Seahawks are going to leave George Pickens singled up nearly as much as the Bengals did. I think they're going to shade a lot of help over to 14 after the game that he just had. That means that Pat Fryermuth and Deontay Johnson are, are going to have to win their routes and eat uh, underneath. And Mason Rudolph is going to have to probably ink and dunk a little bit more than he did. Uh, you know, he showed off the, the nice deep ball against Cincy, but, you know, not only are the Seahawks now aware of that, uh, you know, being in his bag, but their safety play has been really good with Julian Love, who's got four picks, including a big one the other day to clinch their win. Quandre Diggs isn't having as good of a season, but I mean, he's been playing deep safety in this league for a long time. So you're you're not he's not really a guy that you're going to be able to fool too often, I think. So that'll be an interesting uh, you know matchup within the matchup for sure. And beyond all of the passing game, life will be easier for Mason Rudolph if the Steelers can run it against the sixth worst run defense in the league, at least in terms of uh, mm-hmm. yards allowed per game. Uh, Najee Harris and Jalen Warren have both looked good in, in recent weeks. We've seen Najee Harris heat up late in seasons before. Uh, he kind of just, you know, he stays durable. He manages whatever ailments he has going on. I know he missed practice again uh, or was limited again Thursday with a knee. I think they're just managing that. I think they know they're, they're trying to be safe with him. I don't think it's going to limit him in any way, but Hey, even if it does, Jalen Warren has shown what he can do. So that that could be advantage Steelers here uh, in the ground game. And if the Seahawks sell out to try to stop that, then, yeah, Rudolph does have plenty of options that, that he can go to to beat him through the air. Absolutely. I think that that's going to be that's the key here is that the Steelers have to just kind of stay in their state, state of the state of their game plan. Running the football is a big part of that, having a balanced attack. And again, just taking what is there. Like, I think that is, that is a thing here. Like, don't don't necessarily try to force passes into double coverage, hoping for the best in, in those situations. What the Steelers did and what Mason Rudolph did that was very good in his last game was he was able to stay on task. Look to the look to the right places. Have his eyes in the right places. Not panic in the pocket. And I've said all season long, if Kenny Pickett did those things, the Steelers team they'd have been in, they'd have been in a much better place. And I think that's another reason why you ride with Mason Rudolph and you see how long he can keep this up um, and how well you can keep winning around them. We'll talk about other aspects of this matchup, but also some comments by Mason Rudolph that were very interesting about the Steelers quarterback room present and past. We'll do that all here on the North Shore Drive podcast on the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. I'm your host Chris Carter. But first, I want to remind you. 
that this, this this show is sponsored by Mike's Beer Bar, the best bar in all of Pittsburgh. When you go to Mike's Beer Bar, you can you can reserve any table that you want that has one of 20 different televisions that you can tune into any game that you want, whether it's college bowl season, you're into college basketball, NHL, NFL, whatever you want. You can watch it there, including the Steelers' upcoming game against the Seahawks on New Year's Eve. In fact, there's going to be a party there, so you can go check it out this this weekend. But Mike's Beer Bar is the best bar in Pittsburgh. When you're there, don't just try their 500 different available beers, but also try try their amazing food. They have a, a steak on a stone meal that you can't be beat. You bring it, you choose your choice cut of steak. It's brought to you on a heated stone, and every piece of steak that you that you cut off, you press into the stone, and you can choose how well done you want every single bite. It's the best bar in all of Pittsburgh. Go to Mike's Beer Bar today, uh, right on Federal Street, across the street from PNC Park. And when you get there, tell them Chris sent you. We're back here on the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Chris Carter, Brian Batko. Uh, we switch to now the Acrisure Fan Advantage, where every single week the Acrisure Fan Advantage gets you closer to the team than ever before, including questions that you submit to us for our Steelers insider here, Brian Batko, to answer right on the show. And then we bring on our opponent expert each week where we talk with them about the Steelers' upcoming opponent. That'll be coming out tomorrow at the uh, interview with Stacey Joe Rost of Seattle Sports, who covers the Seahawks. But... Right now, let's get into this question submitted via Acrisure.com slash fan advantage from John B, who says Mason using interviews to be passive aggressive at ex teammates. Maybe he did learn something from number seven, aka Ben Roethlisberger. Brian, I want to let this clip play real quick and then we'll add context to it. But here was the clip that you filmed earlier this week from Mason Rudolph in the Steelers media room after practice. John B mentioned and Kenny just about what you all were seeing out there. Yeah, a lot. Um... They were very helpful. Um, you know, I uh, got a lot of respect and, and enjoyed their company very much, both of them. And, and um, there's always a great, no matter who's, no matter who's played, man. There's been great communication, and, and um, everyone is truly trying to, you know, uh, make the other make the other person better. Find you know, find a find a nugget if they see something. You know, suggest something that's truly going to help us out, opposed to, you know, other. There's been other times where there's not a co- co- as cohesive as a group, and people aren't as forthcoming with, hey, look, how, how do we help? So, um, so Brian, and a question about how the quarterback room has been helping each other. Mason Rudolph mentions how it hasn't always been that way, and it seems like there's only a one other era of the Steelers quarterback room that he's been in. Obviously, that seems like a shot at Ben Roethlisberger. What is your what was your response to hearing that? Because you were there for it live. Yeah, I mean, to John's uh, question, I don't think he's taking a shot at ex-teammates. I don't think that's plural. I think there's really ah. one person um, that, that sort of looms over that. And when I tweeted that out, I jokingly said, oh, maybe he's talking about one of those Oklahoma State quarterback rooms. And I should have known a bunch of people from Stillwater got really mad at me. And they're like, are you dumb? He's obviously talking about... Ben Roethlisberger in the series. I'm like, yeah, I know. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, hey, Mason's going down swinging right now, man. He's getting another <laughs> a new lease on his NFL life that he didn't expect to get. None of us expected him to get. He's sort of uh, sort of playing with house money. And at this point, he's trash talking the dealer a little bit because why not? You know, what, what does he have to lose? <laughs> I think we all knew that this was uh, an, an issue or an obstacle for him especially early in his career. But I think that answer just confirms that that persisted a little bit throughout his career. And, you know, for whatever went on in 2018, however, whatever way Ben felt about it and however Mason responded, whether he did so as well as he could or not. And then in, you know, that was whatever Ben was starting. It was a clear delineation of, of roles. 2019 was a different story. You know, Ben was hurt and, Mason probably needed all the help that he could get stepping in there as the starter, uh, you know, in, in week two at halftime. And that just tells me he didn't really receive that. It's a whole other debate of whether it's incumbent upon starting quarterbacks to help out uh, the the younger guys or the, the people below them on the depth chart. Everyone's got different opinions on that. Ryan Tannehill is another NFL starter who's you know been under the microscope for comments in that vein over the years i think he initially said he wasn't really going to help malik willis when he was drafted and then last year was singing a different or this year was singing a different tune when they picked will levis so maybe he either uh 
you know, changed his mind or is at a different point in his career. So Ben clearly, I think bristled too at the Josh Dobbs pick the year before Mason, but maybe he was, uh, you know, more to use Rudolph's words forthcoming uh, in, in other scenarios. I don't know. I don't really, people get so worked up about this. Number one, I do think it's interesting. You have the, some people who are like, Oh, who cares? It's water under the bridge. It's like, this is what we do. You know, these unanswerable questions and mm-hmm. human interest, palace intrigue debates, like that's what makes sports talk fun and what it is. Um, but for people getting really bent out of shape about it and angry that now turning on Mason Rudolph because of something he said uh, on a Wednesday after having the, the great game that he had on Saturday, I mean, you can miss me with that too. It's it's just part of it. It's not really a huge deal. Did Mason throw some shade? Yes. Did Kenny Pickett seem a little pissy answering questions on Wednesday? Yes. Um, he's pro- he's a comp- – can I say pissy? Whatever. I guess I just did. So. We're a podcast. We're fine. Kenny's a competitor. You know, again, it really doesn't matter what these guys are saying in their interview settings. One of them's going to go out there and play. If they struggle, the other one might go in. That's just uh, – that. that's what they're judged by, right? Wins and losses, as Mike Tomlin always says. I don't think anybody's being a – uh, real wet blanket here or somebody that is negatively impacting this team behind the scenes, whether it's Mason, Kenny Pickett, Mitch Trubisky. I believe them all when they say they get along great and they are trying to help each other. Let's be real. Like the, the quarterback rooms are, are one of the tougher things that like you have to think to navigate. Like if you were to put yourself in there, your, yeah. your career only is one. Exactly. Like this isn't a situation where you're sharing handoffs like a running back room or splitting targets like wide receivers. You know, like this is this is very much different from all of that. And it's at the quarterback room, you know, someone else's failures can lead to your successes, but you still want to root for each other because you're teammates and you need to go by the success of the team. And if if you create division, it just makes bigger problems for the team to have to face. So oftentimes it it it, can, it doesn't just lead to guys helping each other. It's a positive thing when this when when quarterbacks do say like, "Hey, you know, we are working together." And that's something that you know when you know Mason Rudolph supposedly called Mitch Trubisky when he was when he was signed, and Kenny Pickett when he was drafted, and was like, "Hey, you know, we're ready to work with you. Happy to happy to be teammates." And everything we've heard from all three of those guys, because now all three of those guys have started since both since since they were put together as a quarterback room. All three of them has said that this room has been very supportive and. You know, there's no hiding. Ben Roethlisberger made open comments about Mason Ruff when he was drafted, and everyone knew Mason Ruff was not going to take Ben's spot until he was ready to go, and yet he still made those comments. And then afterwards, there was obviously some walking around eggshells. Heck, James Washington, who was just Mason Ruff's collegiate teammate, said he felt he had to walk around eggshells around Ben his first year, and obviously there was something there going on there as well. I think it's one of those things that it, it, it is delicate, but if you're professionals, you can work your way around it. And I think that's what the Steelers are doing right now. At least the quarterbacks are trying to do right now. Mason Rudolph getting the play. And Kenny Pickett, you know, saying, you know, you know, asked, you know, if he's learned anything from watching Mason Rudolph from the sidelines. And he simply said, no, I, I honestly took that as kind of like a, yeah. I mean, it's not like Mason Rudolph did anything revolutionary. He did what Kenny Pickett was supposed to be doing. And I think Kenny Pickett knows what he's supposed to be doing. And he's trying to, he's trying to make sure that he takes forward those steps himself by looking and say, Hey, I just need to be more consistent. It's not something I'm not seeing on film. It's not something I'm not studying. It's just a lot harder to put practice to play than people realize. I think I think it's some of these things are a little blown out of proportion. Other things I think are just they're going to be conversation pieces for as long as we for as long as we want them to be. Yeah, I mean Kenny certainly could have handled his answer to that question better. I mean, he's he's probably got to know how that's going to be perceived on the outside rightly or wrongly. But like you said, Chris, I mean, at the same time, I'm sure human nature for him is a little bit miffed at this notion that, yeah, he wasn't playing well and he had to watch from the sideline to, to know what to do. I mean, I, I don't think that's ever really been the issue with Pickett. And also, I mean, what do you expect him to say? It's You think he's just going to kick his feet up and say, yeah, Mason, you got this one. I'm healthy, but go ahead, man. You deserve this. Like, no, I mean, he's as much as Mason Rudolph uh, is is a guy with nothing to lose right now. You know, Kenny Pickett's surely feeling the weight of the expectations and pressure that come with being the first round pick a year ago and the potential franchise quarterback. So yeah, I mean, of course those two guys are going to be operating 
a little bit differently right now uh, with with how they face the public in in the comments that they that they make. Yeah, I think it's gonna it's gonna be interesting. And that's the thing. Uh, we will keep seeing them make comments, and it'll also depend on how things go for the Steelers. If Mason Rudolph starts and does well, you know, he might start against the Ravens too, and then you know they're fighting for a playoff spot and how that goes. If Mason Rudolph doesn't do well and Kenny Pickett goes back in and he does well, or do, there's so many variables that could happen here, and I think it's going to be the ride. This is the ride of when you don't know who your franchise quarterback is. Like, like I said, this is the ultimate them. reality show. Like we yep. really don't know week to week where we're going to be at – uh, 7 30 on Sunday. So I'm, I'm going to enjoy it. I think uh, a lot of folks are going to enjoy it. Enjoy it. Maybe not, uh, maybe not those who are deathly loyal to, to, to Kenny Pickett. Uh, there could be some, a little bit more stress and enjoyment there, I guess, but Hey, let's just, if you don't have any dog in this fight, let's just, uh, you know, sit back and enjoy the ride, see how it plays out. Indeed, we'll talk about that ride and how it needs to continue for the Steelers against the Seahawks here on the North Shore Drive podcast on the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Chris Carter, Brian Batko. We got one more segment here, but first, I'll remind you the show is also brought to you by Savinas Kane and Gallucci. They're mesothelioma and asbestos lawyers with over 85 years of experience that call them now for a free consultation. That's Savinas Kane and Gallucci. We're also brought to you by GameTime.co, where buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all your sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. Pittsburghers, if you're if you're thinking about going to a local game like a Penguins game or a pit basketball game or any any contest or a concert you can go up to the arena and you can see there's scalpers on the street and you can see that there's there's ticket bot there's ticket booth, there's a ticket booth where you can buy your tickets there but you're going to say ah those prices are still too pricey i was trying to wait out for a better prices and when you go to the scalpers you can feel uncertain about yourself you're like ah, i don't know man i don't know if these tickets are going to be the right spots that you can well game time has the best of both worlds why because game time guarantees you that you see where your seats are in the arena and you can even see the view from your seats on the game time app that you can download right to your phone right now and you're also getting the best prices and they're so confident they're giving you the best prices they have a best price guarantee that can't be beat because if you download the game to map and you go there right now you can and they then you get the ticket to an event if you find tickets somewhere else on a different app any, anywhere else and you find the t- uh, pr- ticket prices on the same section and row for less game time will credit you 110 percent of the difference of those prices snag the tickets without the stress with game time download the game to map create an account and use code P-I-T-T pit for $20 off your first purchase or go to the website gametime.co. Terms you can just apply, create an account, redeem code P-I-T-T pit for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. We're back here in the North Shore Drive podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter, here with Brian Batko from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Brian, let's talk about this game a little bit more in depth. Now we, uh, you know, we look at we look at this team, and this is a Seahawks team, just like the Steelers. They've been very up and down this year. They've had really good moments. They've had really bad moments. Um, they've uh, and they've dealt with a lot of injuries. You know, Smith, of course, coming back from injury after he was out for a bit, they had to survive some Drew Lock led days. Um, Drew Lock recently- had a moment in the sun, kind of like Mason's having right now. Absolutely, uh, yeah. And now they've won back-to-back games against the Eagles and the Titans both with the same score 20 to 17 and uh they come back home to face the Steelers they're very much in the in their own playoff race in fact they are the seventh seed in the NFC as it stands here what's the biggest key that you see the Steelers have to lock into to beating the Seahawks team as it stands probably what I mentioned earlier probably establishing the the ground game but also I mean I really worry about DK Metcalf on the Seattle, mm. the Seattle side you know I would be shocked if Joey Porter Jr isn't traveling with him and and trying to shadow him and shut him down but that's easier said than done dk metcalf is just such a unique talent in the league i don't know that he's the best receiver but he's he's arguably the best at taking over a game i mean fastest ball carrier in the league uh since 2020 with his 73 yard touchdown earlier this season i think week 13 i mean he just caught the ball and was gone so that that could absolutely be a thorn in the side for a Steelers defense that has been a little bit leakier at times lately because of the injuries. They're still playing well overall, but susceptible to the big play. And that that was the case even before they lost guys like Cole Holcomb, Quan Alexander, Minka Fitzpatrick, who, I mean, we'll see if he practices today. I don't anticipate him playing this week with that knee injury. So they're going to have to use the sort of trio of Pat Peterson, Eric Rowe and Trenton Thompson to keep a lid on it. Uh, it's it's going to be, I I think there's going to be some points in this game, Chris, put it that way. 
I think so too. I think both of these offenses can put up some numbers here in the in this game. Um, I, I think a big part of this too will be how healthy the Seahawks enter into this contest, as well as you know how healthy uh, the Steelers and and enter this contest because. Uh, you know, Minka Fitzpatrick has not practiced yet all week. I, I'm not anticipating him to be available. If he is, that'd be a heck of a turnaround and a big question. How do they handle uh, everything? They do get Trenton, Trenton Thompson back. That's a good sign, uh, at least for safety depth, so that if one guy doesn't go down, they're, they're trying to put you and you you on the Ray Fittipato back there covering guys. Um, I think Miles Kilbury would get the call before us, but not by much. <laughs> but that's that's what I'm saying. It's 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 been it's been a, a rough situation for them. Uh, but you know, there's also been a been a question. Um, you know, when you look at you know guys like Kenneth Walker who was dealing with a shoulder injury. Um, so I I'm not 100 percent sure how things are going to go. Uh, for for health wise for the Seahawks, but regardless, I think that the, it's a very similar path. Is you know you know that if your offensive line goes to work, you can take control of the of of the the line of scrimmage, and if your defensive front does what it's supposed to do, you can control the line of scrimmage, and then you can make the job that much easier for both Mason Rudolph and then for also your secondary and your off ball linebackers who are trying to fill in a lot of different places with backups. So. I think that's where it comes down to. They need guys like TJ Watt and Alex Highsmith, Cam Hayward, Keanu Benton. They need that front to disrupt the offensive line and to keep whoever is the running back, whether it's Walker or Charbonnet, um, for, uh, for 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 the Seahawks. Keep them from getting from getting uh, from getting busy, and then fo- focus. If DK Metcalf's going to make a big plays, guess what? He's going to have to do it in predictable situations where Joey Porter Jr. not only is able to focus on him, but also maybe even have safety help over top. Uh, in, you know, so that he can be a little bit more aggressive against them. Do those things, and I think the Steelers stand a good chance here. But the question is, will they do those things? Brian, what's your prediction for this game? Yeah, I think if they if they can't really run the ball against the Seahawks, and then they're putting Mason Rudolph in second and third and long situations against a, a, a decent pass rush. You know, Boye Mafe can can get off the ball. You know, they can get some interior pressure from Leonard Williams and the likes of those guys, which worries me because that, you know, the Colts uh, certainly had the upper hand on the Steelers in, in that regard. So I do think that the Steelers are going to be able to control the game offensively to a degree. I think that Mason Rudolph hot hand is, is going to continue here. I have, I, hmm. I, there's a lot of time to tell me to pick the Seahawks and it just seems like often in that scenario, I need to fade myself and just sort <laughs> of go with the, uh, you know, the, the Steelers winning games that on paper they shouldn't. So I'm going to say, I'm going to say Rudolph has another good game. I'm going to say they run the ball. Well, Najee Harris shows out and, and the Seahawks put up some points too. I'm not going to get crazy and predict the Steelers winning two games in a row by two possessions, but I'll go Steelers 28 Seahawks, 25. 28, 25, a three point game in the upper twenties. Brian, you're at you're asking a lot here, but I do think the Steelers get in that scoring range. I actually think it's going to be a one possession game, just looking a little bit differently. I say 26 to 19 Steelers, simply because I think there's going to be a lot of red zone possessions that don't go well offensively for either team. But I also think the Steelers do find a way with Mason Rudolph to make enough happen in the passing game and have the more balanced attack between these two teams. And the Steelers' defense finds a way to create more turnovers against Geno Smith than the other way around um, with. Uh, um, you know, with, with Mason Rudolph, I think Mason Rudolph will be able to keep his composure for them for the most part. Um, but we'll see how this all plays out Sunday, 4 30. Is it weird that it's not on Saturday anymore? We just had like a bunch of Saturday games and I was starting to get used to a Saturday schedule. Now we're back to Sunday and I feel thrown off. I feel like today's actually Saturday. Yeah. I wouldn't mind if, uh, if it was another Saturday game and I guess we still, it's TBD when the Steelers will play the Ravens in week 18, but Maybe we'll get another Saturday kickoff then. Who knows? Who knows, Brian? I just know I have not been picking Steelers games well lately, Chris. I picked the uh, the Bengals <laughs> last week, and the week before that, I sort of just took the Steelers over the Colts on a hunch. It's it's not been going my way uh, of late, and obviously, you know, I, I did pick the Patriots, but of course, I picked the Steelers to beat the Cardinals. So I guess I'm one in one in three or one in four over the last five weeks. Take take my uh, Steelers over Seahawks prediction with a grain of salt well you have the same record as the Steelers then so (laughs) yeah true Uh, but in all serious but all seriousness I think it's gonna it's gonna be it it's it's very tough to tell which direction this team is going to head they've been very up and down all season 
But if they can finish up, I think it'll be create some interesting conversations, especially if the Ravens win their game quickly. We're going to go over some of the games the Steelers you know, that Steelers fans should be looking at here uh, in the playoff races. Here, first, the Bills have to lose out for the Steelers to catch them in the in the in the playoffs. They play the Patriots this week. I think that that ends the conversation of, of the Steelers jumping them in the playoff standings. They are playing games, better lately, but I they don't are. Think the Bills are going to lose at home to them. I agree. Now, the, the games that you should be looking at, pretty much the, all the AFC South games. The Titans play the Texans at home. C.J. Stroud's back. That could be very interesting to see if the Titans, who've lost like three straight heartbreakers, and they look like they're on their last legs of you know of, of just even trying to get to the finish line, while the Texans, they've been struggling, but with C.J. Stroud back, maybe they get a boost. I think that could be an, an interesting game there. But also, Raiders at the Colts. That could be a very interesting game. The Raiders are sur surging, and the Colts had a rough loss last week. And I, I wonder if their if their uh, charge forward is running out. Meanwhile, the Jaguars are also fading, but they are playing the Panthers, and they're at home. Brian, the Steelers just need between those three teams. What two of them have to lose one time if the Steelers want to win out and make, and make the playoffs? If you're looking at this, what is your most likely path to success here? Because Really, you only need – if one of them loses this week and it's just the team that, that wins in the Week 18 matchup uh, uh, between the Texans and the Colts, it could that could be all the Steelers need to open up the door so that they can control their own destiny. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a little bit skeptical of the Texans finishing this season strong. I mean, mm. DJ Stroud likely to come back, but, um, you know, Mike Vrabel – the, the, the Titans, like, they never really – or an easy out either. I mean, they're they're kind of like the Steelers when mm. they're down and out. They're they're never easy to beat. I think Vrabel would relish uh, going to Houston and getting that win after the way the Texans beat them in thrilling fashion a couple weeks ago in that sort of old Houston, new Houston rivalry. So I'm not really a big believer in, in the Texans sneaking their way into the playoffs. I guess that's one team that I I have my eyebrow raised at them. I, I think they could very well. Uh, you know, stumble and maybe next year they're a more consistent team with Stroud in his second season. I hear you there. I, I think the Colts are, are are in. I think the I think the Texans could find a way to beat the Titans. Uh, I think the Colts are in for a. The Raiders have been playing very well under the. I Raiders love what the Raiders coach. are doing, man. I watched a lot of that Christmas game and like utmost credit to Raiders coaches, players. I mean, this season could have gone. They they they, they could have just rails. absolutely gone in the tank with with everything that happened to them, but. They're all playing with personal pride. Antonio Pierce is the interim. Max Crosby, all those dudes. Aiden O'Connell filling in for Jimmy G. That's a team that uh, I, I know there's kind of a, <clears throat> I think, a pervasive sort of thought outside of Pittsburgh for people who don't care about the Steelers, really, that they don't want to see the Steelers in the playoffs because they play such an ugly brand of football <laughs> and, you know, the quarterback. And it's like, are we watching Kenny Pickett or Mason Rudolph? Like, you got to understand it. To Joe Public in, in one of the other 30 NFL markets, it's not real entertaining. But right. the Raiders are another team who I think on paper you'd be like, Why? nobody wants to see Aiden O'Connell in the playoffs. But I don't know, man. These guys are kind of fun lately. Going going and beating the Chiefs on Christmas Day was uh, – was was uh, that was like secondhand enjoyment for me to, to see what they were doing in that game. No, I feel you on that. And, I don't think uh, they're going to make I, it, but uh, they're, they're having right. one of those late season like – you're telling me there's a chance type of runs that the Steelers have been on before. Meanwhile, the other team that you're looking at here, the Jacksonville Jaguars, they have lost four straight and they are not playing well. At first they lost this just back-to-back -back tough games to the Bengals and the Browns. And you're like, oh man, just bad luck. Then they got smashed by the Ravens. And then last week smashed by the Buccaneers. And now they're playing at home against the Panthers. This is the layup win that they need. This is the layup win that if they win this game and the Texans lose, they can, they can put themselves in a position to close it out next week uh, against the Titans. But if they lose this game, they put themselves at risk of losing the division when at one point they were they were eight and three. They were just like they were in a better position than the Steelers were at one point this season uh, when they started their collapse. I, I, I honestly, after the way the Panthers almost beat the Packers last week and the way the, that the Jaguars have been trending, I'm not 100 percent certain the Jaguars win that game. And this could be a situation where if the Jaguars lose and the Colts lose, I like the Steelers chances. Uh, of uh, of making the playoffs then because as long as they they win out 
Um, and also the other game to watch is also Baltimore and Miami, because if the Ravens beat the, the Dolphins, they'll clinch the one seed and probably will rest a lot of starters next week to make sure that they don't get injured uh, before the playoffs. Um, it's there still be a lot of Steelers, but we'd cross that bridge if we get to it. <laughs> it that, exactly. Cross that bridge when you get to it, because the Steelers have lost to plenty of backups all year long. But at the same time, that last week you got every single win to work your way after the previous week getting every single loss to work against you I, I do wonder what the Steelers playoff situation will be if they are able to win this game and how clear of a path it will be for week 18 yeah I said on the Tuesday show with Adam I just have this sneaking suspicion that if the Steelers hold up their end of the bargain which I, I just predicted them to do this week that I think they will get the help they need from the outside so yeah just it feels like every year now we're in these scenarios. We're going through all the potential playoff uh, clinching and outside help needed. That Steelers 2020 team was uh, very Jekyll and Hyde and, you know, had an all-time embarrassing way to go out. But at least they didn't uh, they didn't need any help. They weren't sweating bullets in, in the final weeks of the season. This is just like last year, the year before that, even 2019, even 2018 when it didn't go their way. Uh, this is this is pretty much life following the Steelers in in uh, I wasn't even not even the post Ben era post Ben era but I guess late stage and post Ben era. It certainly it certainly is uh, going to be a wild ride. Uh, Brian, he's are, are you you're going to be on hand in Seattle, correct? No, I'm staying back for this one with the holiday and oh okay uh, and all that. So I will be I will be home. I've been to Seattle yeah. though. It's a it's a cool place. Jerry and Ray and Ron will have a good time out there. I'm sure. Absolutely. Taking the new year with those guys. Brian, I'll see you next year. Uh, as oh, far as this, there you go. I, had, I had to had to hit them with the with the new year joke that every that everyone always throws around out here. But we will see you before the next before the new year because we got Stacia Joe Ross coming on from Seattle Sports on our Saturday episode of the Accuracy Fan Advantage. One final preview inside looks into this to the Seahawks locker room. You want that in-depth look to see it basically what is a playoff game for the Steelers? We'll give it to you here from the Pittsburgh Post at the North Shore Drive podcast. Thanks so much, Brian, for joining us here as always on our Friday episodes. We'll see you again Saturday here on the North Shore Drive Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the North Shore Drive Podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all the sports coverage from the Post-Gazette that we have to offer, visit post-gazette.com.